Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, Working Better Together, Partnering to Improve Quality of Life in Long-Term Care. About this afternoon's session, it is brought to you by Family Councils Ontario. We lead and support families in improving quality of life in long-term care. We do this by working collaboratively with our partners to cultivate effective family councils, mobilize knowledge exchange, and advance public policy system planning and research. My name is Samantha Peck. I'm the Director of Communications and Education for Family Councils Ontario, and I will be the speaker for this afternoon's session. During our Working Better Together webinar, we're going to discuss family involvement in long-term care. Specifically, what are the benefits to being involved with the council, and how to work in collaboration with staff, management, and within your family council to affect positive change and support positive relationships with staff, residents, and families. So we're going to start with some context and definitions to set the stage or lay the foundation for what we talk about in terms of what's necessary to be partners, strategies for success, and specific tips on working together for positive change within your loved one's long-term care home. Long-term care is changing. In 2012, 747,000 Canadians were living with some form of cognitive impairment. When we look at the Ontario context and knowing that 76,000 residents live in long-term care in Ontario, 90% have some form of cognitive impairment. What that means for families and long-term care homes is that families play a very important role in supporting a high level of residents' quality of life. They do that by working together with staff to help staff really get to know the residents who are living in that home. And families also support other family members who are also going along the long-term care journey and can help support community and positive relationships within the home to support a healthy, vibrant community where everyone thrives primary way that they do that is through family councils. A family council is defined as an organized, self-led, self-determining and democratic group composed of family and friends of the residents of a long-term care home. While family councils are a group, like many other community groups, they do have special characteristics. So they come together and interact with one another regularly. For many councils, that's monthly or bi-monthly. They have a collective identity or a shared purpose. And while each family council across the province will be a little bit different, the ultimate goal is improving the quality of life of residents living in long-term care. And they'll have common goals and objectives, which also include supporting families and friends of residents, so an emphasis on the peer support aspect of a family council. They also give families a voice in decisions that affect them and their loved ones in the home. It's a way to support community engagement and quality improvement and give families a true meaningful involvement in that home. And it's not just about complaints. It's working together to find solutions and come up with creative ideas for improving quality of life and care in long-term care. Ultimately, it's about supporting all residents. And it's also important to note that family councils do have some degree of structure, rules, and methods of operation. So now that we have a basic understanding of what a family council is, what are the benefits to getting involved and how can families do that in a way that achieves the goal of ultimately improving the quality of life of residents in long-term care and bettering the home and all residents? Now, each family council will do this in a little bit diff a little differently. And its members will take on different pieces of work or tasks within the council to fulfill that goal. 
some councils have an emphasis on supporting the physical plant or infrastructure of the home, such as a family council who took on this project pictured here of improving the outdoor sitting space. So they worked in collaboration with the long-term care home to carry that out. Others put a great emphasis on staff support. So recognizing staff for the work that they do within the home. Others work to bring joy and love and community in long-term care. Uh, in this photo, there's a woman who from Northern Ontario was very engaged in her local theater community and loved to bring her props and other costume pieces into the home just to make people smile, to bring a little bit of joy and something different into that home. It was an emphasis on small moments of joy and building community. All family councils will work together to do effective problem solving, to do that working together for positive change. You've probably heard the saying that two heads are better than one. Well, one of the beautiful aspects of a family council is that it brings together many people from different backgrounds and skills and experiences who can tackle issues in a way that is creative and effective and brings the team together, working with family, staff, and residents to create positive change and support quality improvement. Other councils put an emphasis on intergenerational partnerships or providing opportunities and space for families to gather within the home, so to create connections to the broader community. Others have taken on projects to support new families to the home through a family welcome basket with an insider tip sheet. That's a way to create relationships with new families and support them along their, their journey and their transition to long-term care. Others support events the home is having, so running a table at a services expo. Others have emphasized connections to the broader community and looking at ways to change the perception of long-term care through educating the public. Others have taken on real practical issues within the long-term care home, so a lost laundry sort and lost and found event to get items back to their rightful owners. We know that laundry is a common challenge and opportunity, let's say, in long-term care. So a family council took on the lost and found and held an event to get the items back to their rightful owners and also to connect with families as they came to the event. Other support initiatives or events the home is holding by finding local entertainment or staffing a table at an event, so taking on face painting or something else to bring joy to that event. So each family council may emphasize a different aspect of the work, but the common thread through all of these stories and photos is that families have stepped forward to work in collaboration both within the council to take on an event or a task or to work with the home to do so. And it's important to keep in mind that none of these initiatives were done by just one person. It was all of the family members pulling together, figuring out the unique skills and interests of their members and working together to carry this out. And all of these made a large difference in the home and in the lives of the residents who live there, as well as the families, staff, volunteers, and public who are engaged in that care community. Another unique aspect of family councils that we need to keep in mind is that they are in the Long-Term Care Homes Act. The Act has information on the licensee's duty to assist and cooperate with the council bit of information on who can and cannot be a member, information on the powers of a family council, licensee duty to respond and cooperate, family council assistant, duty to meet with and consult, staff in 
staff attendance at meetings, interference, and so on. So the legislation is important for your council to be aware of. You can read the entire act online. The link is down at the bottom of this slide. And we also have information on our website about the act as it pertains to family councils. You can visit us online at www.fco.ngo. And our link to our website will be available at the end of the session as well. So now that we have an understanding of the foundation, the basics of a family council, what's necessary to truly be partners? And we're talking about partnership because that is how you really work well in collaboration with staff and management to affect change, to support quality improvement, and to build positive relationships with your families, staff, and residents. So what do we mean when we actually talk about partnership? According to the World Health Organization, partnership is a collaborative relationship between two or more parties based on trust, equality, and mutual understanding for the achievement of a specified goal. And partnerships usually have the following characteristics. The parties involved have a personal stake in the partnership. So for families, it's wanting to ensure that their loved one has a good quality of life and care while living in that home. It will often extend to ensuring that all of the residents living there have the same quality of life and care. For staff, it's about wor working hard and making sure that the people that they are caring for and in whose homes they work are well cared for as well, and that the families are seen as true partners in long-term care. The partners are working towards a common goal or aim. So as we said, for family councils, it's ensuring that residents have the highest quality of life and care possible. Partners will also have a similar set of beliefs or values. So for example, that could be collaboration, resident and family-centered care, transparency, honesty, and so on. Partners will also work together over a period of time. Now for family councils, this could be an open-ended period of time. So for your members, you may or often will just have your family council will exist for as long as it does. Members may come and go, but your council survives. Or it could be that you're looking at a partnership for a particular piece of work or a project. So you'll want to have that laid out clearly as well. There's also going to be agreement that this partnership is necessary and beneficial. So keeping an eye on the ultimate goal and recognizing that this partnership will make a difference to the residents, families, and staff. So that even if things get challenging, you've established from the get-go that this is necessary and beneficial. There also needs to be an understanding of the value that each partner contributes. So it's important to reflect on what each party is bringing to the table. So staff, residents, and families, what are the unique skill sets or perspectives that they are bringing to help you achieve that common goal? And finally, and this cannot be understated, there is respect and trust between the different partners. So that's going to really set out a strong foundation for your partnership so that when you do look to collaborate with family, staff, management, perhaps your residence council, volunteers, and so on, that you have a foundation of respect and trust. That will go a long way towards helping you achieve your common or ultimate goal. Now, like everything else, it's important to have a plan. Failing to plan is planning to fail, quote by Alan Lakian. So think about your plan, your partnership plan. So you should be looking to explore who are your partners. And this can serve you well for thinking generally about your family council as it relates to other partners within your home or for a certain project, event, or an initiative. So who are your partners? What's your vision? So what are you trying to achieve? What are your specific goals? What benefits do you hope to realize? And how are you going to actually accomplish this? 
So let's talk about those things a little bit more in detail. So who are your partners? Primarily, as family council members or staff who work with a family council, your partners, your family council, and the council members. But also think about who else interacts with your family council. Who are those formal and informal partners that are essential to helping you improve the quality of life for the residents and build community in your home? So other families and friends of residents who, while they don't attend family council meetings perhaps, are still considered and eligible for membership on your council. So think about the families and friends who you can connect with but who aren't necessarily coming to your meetings. Long-term care home staff are invaluable supports and partners for your family council. And while family councils are autonomous and independent, and staff don't run your meetings or your council, they're still invaluable allies and supports to help you achieve your goals. And of course, because we're working to support quality of life for residents, you also look at, want to look at your residents and your residence council. Some councils, some family councils, have established and strong relationships and partnerships with their residence council. If you don't currently, perhaps this is a really good opportunity to think about connecting with them. So thinking about how you can discuss common goals, initiatives, projects, or events. If you can do that, you can amplify the benefits of family involvement in long-term care. Some councils also have strong relationships with their volunteer program or the students or community groups. So as we saw in the examples of what family involvement looks like in long-term care, many councils had partnered with community groups to carry out projects or initiatives or events. An example that we talked about of finding entertainment for a family barbecue. That's one example of connecting with a community group or organization to carry out something really wonderful. So what's your vision? What do you hope to accomplish by working together? For your family council, for your general partnerships, improving the quality of life for all residents, and supporting the benefits of family involvement in long-term care. For a specific event, initiative, or project, you'll want to look at what your vision is for that as well. So what's your ultimate goal for this and how do you plan to achieve it? One way to look at this is to focus to carry out that vision. So look at the goals, the benefits, and processes that are integral to that vision. We consider there to be four basic family council goals. And each family council will place greater or lesser emphasis on each of these, depending on the culture, nature, interests, and activities of that council. You'll often find all four are relevant to your group. So peer support, so for families, by families, teamwork, so working to develop teams, teamwork and partnership within your home, Education, so that could be around things that happen within your home, perhaps how the dietary department works, how are menus created, or it could be on health issues affecting residents, so Alzheimer's or Parkinson. And there's also advocacy or effective problem solving, which we'll talk about a bit more in depth towards the end of this session. But when we talk about advocacy, we talk about collective concerns. So not individual concerns that family members bring forward, although you can support them in getting this addressed, family council is really about collective issues. So issues or opportunities for improvement that affect multiple or all residents. It's also always helpful to think about your vision and what you're trying to do in partnership in terms of benefits. So family councils and family involvement in long-term care benefits the home. So by working together, you're creating and improving quality of life for all residents and building community. You're also partnering with staff and building 
relationships. The long-term care system as a whole benefits, particularly when concerns or opportunities for involvement or improvement, rather, can be addressed at a local level, which is often more resource efficient. Of course, family involvement benefits families as it gives them a meaningful involvement in the long-term care home system and a way to be involved, continue to be involved in their loved one's life. Ultimately, family councils benefit the residents. You're there to improve the quality of life for your loved one and the other people living in that long-term care home. So whenever you're working in partnership to try to carry out a vision, reflect on the benefits. So think back, make sure it is going to benefit your residents and your families, but you can also communicate clearly what you expect those benefits to be. It's a good way to build those positive relationships because you're highlighting what the different partners around the table will ex be able to expect from this event or initiative. And you also need to think about how you're going to carry out your partnership or build it, carry out an event. So what are your values and how are you going to support your partnership? It's helpful to think about having clear roles and responsibilities for what you're taking on. So if you're working in collaboration with your long-term care home on an event or a project, it's very helpful to clearly outline who's expected to do what. It can also help to ensure that you have fair expectations of all the parties who are supporting the initiative. And then it makes it so that everyone is very clear on what they need to do. A code of conduct is also very useful because it outlines what behaviors are expected of family council members as they carry out their work. And of course, the importance of a terms of reference can't be understated. These are your basic operating procedures and processes which are going to help you carry out your work in a way that's effective and efficient because you've already established your ground rules and your processes. And it helps to reduce the odds of conflict later along the process because you're operating according to agreed upon and established processes and procedures. We also have a Terms of Reference webinar that's archived and available on our YouTube channel for more information. So now that we have a better idea of some of the benefits of family involvement in long-term care, what a partnership is and why it's important as we carry out our work, how do we make sure that this is successful? So let's start with collaboration. So we heard that collaboration is an essential aspect of family councils. So what does that mean? It means that everyone has a role to play. There's clarity of roles and expectations. So everyone knows what they're expected to do. It's also about inspiring participation and ensuring that those contributions are meaningful and valued. So what does inspiring participation mean? Really, it's about figuring out what your family council members are good at. What are people's skills and interests? And how can they use that to contribute to your council? For example, if you're looking to increase your communications reach, so letting more families know that you exist and what you're doing, or say you're looking for volunteers for a project or an initiative that you want to take on. So you break down the pieces of work, figure out who's good at what, and make that a match. So let's say you are looking to increase your reach, and you've decided that you really need a new brochure about your family council in your admission package, which is something that, as per the Long-Term Care Homes Act, you can do. So let's say you've decided that is going to be one of your activities. But how do you actually do that? So you'd need to figure out who's the best person to take on that piece of work. So maybe you break it up into having someone who is really good at figuring out the language that's going to appeal to new families. So perhaps you have a content writer. 
And then in order to get that content into a, a user-friendly and visually appealing form, you figure out who's really good at design. So perhaps there's someone who on your, on your council who has a background in graphic design and you can create a brochure for you. So these are pieces of work which are really meaningful and important because you need them in order to be able to carry out this activity and support your goal of increasing your reach to new families. But it's also having people use their unique skills and abilities to support your council. And it makes people feel, rightly so, valued and appreciated for what they bring to the table. And they're more likely to continue their involvement on your council if those, recognition, if those contributions are recognized and valued. So figure out what sparks people, whether it's a skill, a passion, an interest. Maybe you have an artist on your council who can help with a face painting table at your summer barbecue. Or perhaps it's someone who really loves talking to new families as they meet them in the hallway. Perhaps that person is your new family orientation or volunteer for your council. They're the person who's going to get new families to the next meeting. Recognize that and honor it, and perhaps that's a specific role that they can play on your council. It's how they can support an effective collaboration. Communication is essential to carrying out your work. We need to communicate respectfully and effectively Realizing that communication is an ongoing two-way process, messages should be clear, complete, concise, and appropriate to the audience. So make sure that you're giving the correct amount of information. You don't want too much or too little. And how the best method for that communication depends on what it is. So think about all the different ways that you communicate with your different partners. So within your family council and between your family council, new families, staff, residents, and so on. So what works best? And it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. Perhaps within your council, you do an email list so people can stay up to date between meetings. Perhaps in working with your administrator for updates for meetings, you want just bullet points. But be clear about what it is that you're looking for. And to ensure it's working, invite feedback. So you can ask your family council members, how are we finding our meeting minutes? Are those useful? What about our email list? Are we using that well? What do we think about this poster or this other piece that we've put out? So make sure that your communications are meaningful and appropriate. It's going to go a long way towards supporting effective relationships if you're clear, honest, and transparent in your communications. We want to engage authentically. So what does that mean? We want to ask questions and ask and seek to understand others' experiences. If someone seems to be having a hard time with something at your meeting, or the partnership seems challenged, ask. Seek opportunities to build and strengthen relationships by asking questions. Ask open-ended questions about how people felt about something or a, about a meeting. Take five to 10 minutes at the end of a family council meeting and ask, what worked well? What can we improve on? Seek to ask, to understand, and then to listen. So listen to understand, not just to respond. That'll go a long way towards supporting positive relationships and building community when we listen to really try to understand what people are saying to us. It shows that we're hearing people, not just listening to what they have to say, but truly, truly hearing them. Be open to feedback and new ways of doing things. As I said, one of the wonderful things about a family council is that it brings together people with diverse backgrounds, skills, and experiences. So be open to learning more about those and how you can incorporate that into your family council. So ask about your members. 
ask what they do. So what do they do professionally? What really interests them? What other volunteer work do they do? Find out what they're passionate about or skilled or knowledgeable about and see how you can use that to create stronger partnerships and build community and increase quality of life in your home. So engage regularly, particularly when we're talking about partnerships between staff, residents, and so on. Engage regularly. Provide updates. Talk about what's going well. Not just challenges, but success stories as well. It'll go a long way towards building positive and effective relationships. Keep note of the verbal versus nonverbal communication. Only about 7% of what we communicate is verbal. So paying attention to body language, tone of voice, and so on is important for building relationships. So if people look uncomfortable, then that can be a clue. You can ask them about that if you have a relationship that supports that, because that will then build even better relationships. Understand emotions. So families, residents, and so on go through a wide range of emotions moving into and living and visiting long-term care. So understand that and be respectful of the different journeys people are on. Embrace the diversity that is long-term care. If people from a wide variety of backgrounds living, working, and visiting in long-term care. So, now that we understand that we need partnerships and a few tips on how we can build even stronger ones, what does it look like when we're using those partnerships to work together for positive change? So this is what we talked about, about advocacy. So Family Council advocacy is really working together on collective concerns. That's often why family members will come to a Family Council for the first time. Perhaps they have a question or there's a challenge they've encountered that fa other families have already been through. So you can support new families into getting used to long-term care. So that insider information. So perhaps it's around how the laundry service works or what programs might be best for a new resident or what supports there are for family members who are struggling. But what will often keep people at a council meeting is when you're focusing on quality improvement. So not just complaints, but opportunities for improvement. And that could be an issue within the home or broader concerns. And it's not just fixing something that isn't working. That's an important part of what a family council can do in terms of the power to advise a licensee of concerns or recommendations the council has. But it could also just be opportunities for improvement. Perhaps it's around staff appreciation. Maybe it is around a welcome basket for new families with that insider information. Or it's looking at more weekend and evening programming for residents. Whatever it is, it's about a collective issue, something that impacts or supports many residents. It's about working together as a team. So your advocacy or problem solving efforts will be much more successful if you're working together and that's within your council, but it's also the relationship between your council and your staff. Your efforts will be a lot more successful if you've already built a strong partnership and strong collaborations with staff and management. And if you've shown that the benefits of family involvement in long-term care are meaningful and numerous, it'll go a long way towards supporting. It's ultimately about improving the quality of life for all of the people who live in long-term care. So advocacy is a shared issue, shared solutions, and a collective voice. So by law, you have the right as a family council or the power to advise the licensee of any concerns or recommendations your council has. So that's the issue. But you can also come up with solutions. So even just demonstrating that you've thought about ways that you can work with the home to address something or improve a process, it will go a long way towards building that partnership. 
It's also important to note the Long-Term Care Homes Act establishes that the long-term care home has a duty to respond in writing within 10 days of receiving the notice. It doesn't mean that they fix the issue within 10 days. If they can, they will. Or it can be giving you a plan of action for correcting it. It may be the start of more conversations about how to address a challenge or an idea. So you can think about this as a starting point. Hopefully you already have a strong relationship that you can build on and use as you work through this. But think about it as one step in the culture change and quality improvement process. Some specific tips for advocacy or effective problem solving. Work together as a team. So let's say you have an idea that you want to do whatever it is, an activity, an event, maybe it's improving the gazebo. So work together as a team. So break up the pieces of work that you need to do. So do your research. Perhaps one person's going to look at one aspect of something. Another person is going to go talk to a long-term care home staff person about it and get some information there. So get your facts, but work together as a team. So listen to if there's any differences of opinions amongst your members. So be careful that you don't just jump on one idea without talking to your members first. Family councils are independent and autonomous and self-led. What that means is that it's really about the members. So the membership needs to come together regarding whatever it is that you're doing in order to be truly successful. You need those partnerships and the established collaborations in order to move forward well. Attitude matters. So yelling louder is not going to get you what you want. So always be polite, say thank you, be patient, and celebrate success, even if it's one step in your process or your journey. So if you've gotten a piece of information around what would be involved in replacing or updating or fixing the gazebo? Say thank you for that. That goes a long way towards building those effective and respectful relationships that will help you achieve your goals. And then it's time to put your plan into action. So now that if you have an idea of something that you want to carry out, a project or an initiative, or maybe you're gonna take an opportunity to Reflect on how your council works and see if you can improve any of those relationships. Can your involvement in your long-term care home be better? Can you reach out to more people? Perhaps it's an opportunity to connect more closely with your home's residence council or to refresh a relationship with your administrator. So think through what you want that partnership plan to look like. What are your strategies going to be? What are your values in coming forward and, and working together in partnership? Do you need to reflect more deeply on the benefits of family involvement in long-term care? Maybe the opportunity in terms of partnership is to have more family council members. So think about how you can work better together. So look at your benefits, your processes, and your goals to see what you can achieve in partnership. So tips for moving forward. Stay positive. Inspire participation. So figure out what sparks your members. What are they passionate about and interested in? Always look to recruit. So think about what partnerships you can create within your home to increase your reach to new family members. This is one area where staff and residents can be really helpful partners in reaching new families. So evaluate regularly. Make sure that you're checking in with your members as you go and also every year in terms of a formal evaluation. And eval an evaluation can be as simple as asking, how was this for you? What was your experience like at this meeting or this event? Consider connecting with other family councils. On our website, we have a database of family councils and the information has been submitted by family council members in order to connect with other groups. So take a look at that on our website and see what groups are in your area that you can connect with. 
and also follow up with us at Family Councils of Ontario. You can reach us by phone or email. You can also reach us online at our website, fco.ngo, which contains our database of family councils, a wealth of resources and information on family council basics, the Long-Term Care Homes Act, and other issues within the long-term care sector. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. So reach us there and share with us what you're working on. And on that note, it is time for questions. Ah, question about the link to our YouTube channel. So it is a very long link. The easiest way to actually get that is to go to our website. And on the home page of our site, you'll see a little YouTube icon under the sign up for our newsletter, donate now and contact us buttons. So you can click there. And on our YouTube channel, you can find copies or archived versions of Family Council 101 of our Terms of Reference webinar, uh, top 10 tips for making it work, and more. Uh, recruitment, a common challenge. Many families still work and can't dedicate time to coming to a meeting or joining. How do we draw people in? To start, recruitment is an ongoing challenge. I have yet to meet a family council that has said that they are fully recruited and they're not thinking about recruitment anymore. So a good place to start is figuring out what people are interested in. So a good way to do that is a family interest survey. And we have a couple of examples available in our Family Council Handbook, your guide to starting and maintaining a family council that you can find on our website. And what this does is it asks questions on, do you know about a family council? Have you ever been to one of our meetings? What do you want to know more about? And logistics around what time and day works best for you. So the long-term care home staff or family council member can make copies of this and send it out by mail. If you have an email list, you can do it that way. SurveyMonkey is a free tool that you can create short surveys if you want to do an online version. You can have copies available at the front desk. And what this does is it gives you information about what people want and when they can come to a meeting. So that's a good place to start just figuring out some of those logistics. And then take that information and see if there are any common themes there. So maybe what it is is that people are concerned about uh, wanting to know more about the Alzheimer's disease. So have the Alzheimer's Society come in and run a session for you. They're often, the local chapters are very interested in connecting with families and it's something that they can do. You can also think about what are other I, what are other things families want to know? So you could have a meet and greet with department heads within the, within the home. So a meet the administrator night. So something that isn't necessarily a family council meeting, but is an event put on by family council that people will come to. So that's something that's often really useful in drawing people in. And then once you've got people gathered around a table, then you start to talk about what a family council is and what it does. Some people, may not be able to commit the time to attending every meeting. So you can think about different strategies. Maybe they are members at large and you send them information via your email list every month. And if there's something of interest, they'll come to a meeting or they can volunteer for a project. You can also talk about some of the logistics issues. Maybe people are worried it's too much time. So you can put their minds at ease by saying, well, this is actually the requirements of a family council. So there's different ways to start figuring out how to get more people in. Family interest survey, figuring out what people want and then delivering on some of that. And then a personal invitation also works really well. So you know, maybe your most outgoing family council member can be in charge of connecting with new families. If you can have in your admission package or during the admission process a way to distribute information about the family council or to get permission for family council to contact that new family member, that works really well, again. Also, we've talked about different aspects of recruitment in our weekly blog. So you can take a look at our archive and see what ideas pop up there. So I was talking about having family councils Ontario do local events. So we do. 
throughout the province when we can. We're a very small staff team, so we endeavor to get to as many places as possible as time and resources permit. So the best way to do that is to go to our website, fco.ngo, under the Education and Networking section, take a look at our list of presentations and workshops, including the details and requirements, and then that'll give you a link to request a service. So you'd select which presentation you want and when. Uh, we do require at least two months notice in order to be able to do in-person sessions, and there may be an attendance requirement for some of them, particularly our workshops. So take a look at our website through our list of sessions, take a look at the form to submit a request, and then we'll follow up with you. Good question. What if the owner of the home invites himself to our family council meeting? So as per the Long-Term Care Homes Act, long-term care home staff can only attend family council meetings upon invitation by the council. So a first step would be to make sure that that person is aware of the legislation. So knowing that they can't do that, it does have to be an invitation from the family council to attend a meeting, and that's to ensure that there's no interference by the licensee or the home in the family council, and to give families a safe place to discuss their concerns and ideas. So start with some education, and then try to figure out what it is that the staff person's looking for. So do they want to just have a closer connection to the family council? So is that a partnership that's an opportunity that you need to explore? So figure out what it is that they're looking for. So ask, figure out what it is. Um, do they just looking for information? They want to know uh, what your common concerns or challenges are. How can, so how can you address that if that's, if that's the unmet need, let's, let's say. But so make sure they know what the legislation is and then try to figure out what it is that they're looking for through that invitation or attendance to the meeting. And if it is something that you feel is inappropriate, reiterate that by law, they cannot simply attend family council meetings without an invitation. Now the question, volunteers have to have a police check. Can family council members have contact with residents without the police check? So generally speaking, family council members are not volunteers of the home, so they wouldn't be subject to the same police check requirements. However, if the family council member is fulfilling a volunteer duty or task in the home, so something that falls under the volunteer department and therefore they're acting as a volunteer and not just as a family council member, that may be appropriate. But without more information uh, about the specifics of that, which we can't get into at this time, uh, the answer is generally family council members don't need police checks, but there are instances where a family council member is wearing multiple hats, and as they're wearing their volunteer hat, they may need a police check. The best way uh, to get more information is to send me an email or give us a call next week, and we can talk about this more. Okay. Question about confidentiality agreements. Do other family councils requ require members to sign a confidentiality agreement? Some family councils will have a confidentiality agreement or statement that their members are expected to abide by. That would be appropriate if that's the council's decision for the membership and it's agreed on by the council and its membership. So some do. However, it's inappropriate for the home or the staff to request that family council or the members do so. So any confidentiality agreement as it pertains to the family council needs to be decided upon by the council. So it's an internal council process. Some have taken the approach of reading out their confidentiality statement at the beginning of each meeting, but not necessarily having a signed document. So councils do that differently, but it is an internal process and decision. What's the duty of the home to act on suggestions, concerns brought forward by family council? So that's the 10 days piece that they have a duty to respond in writing within 10 days of receiving the concern or recommendation. So if it's something that can be fixed within the 10 days, they'll do so and let you know when that's been done. If it's something that will be addressed but takes longer than 10 days, the response is that they're, they'll do so and here's how. If it's something that can't be fixed or concern 
a recommendation that's unfounded, the response would be the reasons for that. So there's more information on that on our website, or you can follow up by email as well. We would like to receive a report on how the long-term care is currently measuring their goals. For example, percentage of agency staff. To date, we have not been provided with this type of info. Is this something we should be able to get? It's not necessarily something that is in the legislation. So you would need to have a conversation with, um, with your home. If it's part of their quality improvement plans, then that's a bit different. But so you would need to follow up with your home. I don't have a, a definite answer on that, but you should ask your home about if that's within their quality improvement or other plans. It could also be something if it's been flagged in your satisfaction survey, the annual resident family satisfaction survey. If it's in that, then there are requirements for the home to involve you in, or involve the council in developing, carrying out, and acting on the results of that survey. Thank you for joining us for this session, Working Better Together. My name is Samantha Peck. I am the Director of Communications for Education. If you have any questions about this session or any of our other recorded webinars, please contact us by phone, email, or online. You can also join us on Facebook and Twitter to share your stories and ideas. Thank you very much for attending and listening to this session.